852, also a 3% increase. And the worst news of today, we learned of 55 new fallen souls, 55 deaths, the most we've experienced in a single day. And I want to pause here for a moment because so many of you have asked me, how can we see the curve bending but the deaths going up? Just because the curve is bending, it doesn't mean that we're not adding new cases. And deaths, of course, are a lagging indicator. As I mentioned last week, this and the coming weeks would be the worst weeks we face, and that certainly is bearing out. This is a 13% increase that has brought the total number of fallen in Los Angeles to 455, and the third day in a row, unfortunately, we have seen record deaths. For comparison, the past seven days, we've seen an average daily increase of 34 new deaths, and they're doubling every six days. And deaths aren't statistics, they are stories, they aren't numbers, they are lives. And so everybody who's out there still mourning the deaths that came before this 24-hour period, we are with you. And for the families that have joined with them today, our hearts break alongside you. And when we can come out of this, we will hold you and contain that pain with you together. We're tracking hospital bed inventory, and that stays strong here in the county. Our general emergency hospitals have today 1,558 available beds. Of those, 1,309 are acute care beds and 249 are ICU beds. And we have an inventory of more than 1,000, 1,129 to be exact, available ventilators. Every day I've made it a point to talk a little bit about testing, and that's why we are here today in this parking lot, because we know it stops the spread of this virus. It helps us save you, but it also helps us identify, if you are positive, who you've come into contact with, so we can let them know to quarantine, to be safe, and to not spread to others. It's why Los Angeles, at the beginning of this crisis as a city with no funding appropriated, no necessarily expertise in the area, stepped up to fill this national void. We launched our own testing program led by our fire department and our personnel department. And we moved quickly. We built a testing infrastructure from the ground up. And I want to thank Deputy Mayor Jeff Gurel and his team. I want to thank Dr. Eckstein from the fire department and everybody who stepped up and the county, Dr. Kazan and everybody else who have now joined. It's something that we never did before, but it's something we can be proud of because I know it's saving lives. On Friday, March 20th, we started with one drive through location in Elysian Park. Three days later, we opened four sites to the public. This testing site at Crenshaw Christian was among the very first, and to date has tested almost 10,000 people. That means this site has tested more than many states in America. Across the county, we're now up to 30 testing sites, including 10 within the city limits and 20 in other cities and unincorporated areas of the county, with the capacity now to test 11,000 people per day. By the end of today, we will have tested approximately 61,000 Angelinos across all of these sites. That's one day early on the goal that we set. And let me put that in perspective. The number of tests that we did yesterday was a third of the entire state of California's total. And we have the capacity today to do more than half the tests that California did in the last 24 hours. That's something Los Angeles and Southern California can be very proud of. We get the job done and we do it ahead of schedule. In just one week, we've doubled the number of people tested, and one week from today, we will have tested 90,000 people. We've also not just used testing centers. We've rolled out rapid response testing at nursing homes because we know that those can be death traps for the seniors who are members of our family and whom we love. We know that in the week since this program has launched, our LAFD rapid response team has now tested over 600 residents seniors living in senior care homes, and the staff of nursing homes that have seen COVID-19 cases. We've opened same or next day testing to everyone with symptoms, thanks to a partnership with the county, who have quick, quickly amplified the work that we have done to reach even more communities. And as I've shared with you, the data early on shows that this is disproportionately hitting the African-American community. 9% of the county's population, the latest numbers show 15% of the deaths are among African-Americans. So we doubled the size of the Crenshaw site here when we heard that. We opened up a walk-up location at Kedron Community Health Center here in South LA. And through our partnership with the county, sites were just added at the Forum in Inglewood and Charles Drew University in Willowbrook, just south of Watts. From the beginning, we always follow the guide of medical professionals, not the instincts of anybody or the 
recommended political advice, but what our public health professionals tell us we need to do. And the County Department of Public Health endorsed these oral swab tests that are administered at the city and county testing sites. What's great about them is they don't require nurses who are already stretched thin in our hospitals to administer them. That keeps them on the front lines at hospitals where they are needed most. And I say this every night, but I'll say it again tonight. Get tested immediately. If you're out there and you have symptoms, please go to coronavirus.lacity.org slash testing and get yourself a test. Signups are for individuals, so I remind everybody, you can't sign up once for the whole family and bring them. Each member of the family needs to fill that out. If you do it back to back, you can usually get the same place and go together. And we need folks to get tested. And we're so blessed to have a medical leader like Professor Cynthia David sharing this message far and wide. Davis, excuse me. Professor Davis has worked in healthcare for more than 35 years, with many of those spent in South Los Angeles here. And long before this crisis, she saved lives. The HIV crisis, she was somebody on the front lines, especially in communities of color, saying, get tested. So I know this is a familiar message tonight. Um, she helped develop the first mobile HIV testing and community outreach project initiated in LA County in 1991. And her work has helped make Los Angeles stronger, safer, healthier, more equitable. And so I'd like to turn it over to her to say some words. Thank you so much for being Thank here tonight. Thank you, Mayor Garzetti. Good evening. Even though I've worked in the HIV AIDS arena for the past 36 years, we can learn uh, from effective public health measures taken over the past 40 years to reduce the global HIV pandemic in this current fight to eliminate infection with COVID-19. First and foremost, it is important that residents throughout the city and county of Los Angeles, and especially South Los Angeles, know your status by taking a COVID-19 test as soon as possible. The test is a simple oral swab, which is self-administered, and results are available within a few days. There are now more drive-up testing sites, such as the one here at Crenshaw Christian Center, so that South LA residents can get tested. Secondly, we all have to adhere to social distancing guidelines, as well as ensure we are practicing good personal hygiene at all times. If you know your status and you are positive for COVID-19, then it is so important to self-isolate and quarantine in your home and ensure the safety of other family members. If you are homeless and positive, then you need to obtain shelter in one of the city or county funded shelters so that you are not exposing people on the streets. Just like with HIV infection, you want to use what is called universal precautions which means you treat everyone as if they were infected with COVID-19 and take the appropriate precautions, including hand washing, wearing a face mask in public places, sanitizing surfaces in your home, in your car, and again, social distancing. COVID-19 is very different from the HIV pandemic. COVID-19 is airborne. It can be contracted from casual contact with an infected person and is very contagious. HIV is not airborne, nor can you acquire HIV by casual contact. With, infection, with HIV infection, it took approximately 40 years to get to 1.1 million cases of people infected or living with HIV in the U.S. With COVID-19, it has taken two to three months to reach 500,000 plus cases of people infected with COVID-19 in the U.S. Lastly, it is predicted that there may be a second or third wave of COVID-19 infection in the fall and beyond next fall. So we have to be prepared and vigilant to maintain the social distancing measures which are currently flattening the curve in the U.S. We cannot afford more community spread of this virus which is preventable if we are abiding by the social distancing guidelines outlined by public health officials. Please listen to our public health officials and government leaders, including Mayor Garcetti. We can survive this pandemic by educating ourselves, knowing the facts of how it is spread and practicing good hygiene, wearing face masks in public and maintaining social distancing. To learn where you can make an appointment to get a test, go to the internet to covid19.lacounty.gov backslash testing. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Davis. And we know that this is a virus that doesn't discriminate, but its impact can. 
And that's why we're depending on everybody in all communities to get tested and to make sure that years of health inequities don't result in more people dying. Poverty kills, health inequities kill, but our efforts can equalize that playing field. Next, I'd like to turn over uh, to speak next, Sean Penn, who I'm so grateful for being here. As I mentioned, CORE, the group that he helped to start, has provided almost 70 staff to run four of the city's testing sites. That support ensures sites can operate and frees up valuable LAFD firefighters and uh, paramedics to focus on their emergency response work. And I'm so grateful that you're here. You've saved lives in the Caribbean, in the Gulf Coast, in Puerto Rico, in Haiti. Um, and now to do it here in your backyard, it means the world. Thank you, Sean. Turn it over to you. Thank you, Mayor. Yes, uh, and uh, speaking on behalf of CORE, I want to begin by thanking the extraordinary staff and, and volunteers that CORE, in its, in its partnership uh, with the Mayor's Office and the LAFD, have been able to attract uh, to help their own community. The, the, this is a very unique situation for us. We started after the 2010 earth, earthquake in Haiti. Uh, we got our sea legs through a devastating cholera epidemic in Haiti. And when we began to expand out uh, to, in, into the uh, hurricane belt to the United States, um, and through all of those, while we had some great touchstones within governance, we have never experienced such an extraordinary uh, holistic leadership and what that means for an organization like ours to be able to have the leadership of Mir Garcetti and the Los Angeles Fire Department is that with their faith we are able to mobilize very quickly their faith and their training so this is I think a, 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 what I hope will be a model in terms of the the governance and NGO or community foundation partnerships that can be replicated not only in, in the city of Los Angeles and, and throughout California, but ultimately throughout the country. And it's going to be part of our job to take lessons learned from the mayor's office and Los Angeles Fire Department and, and be able to animate that message uh, beyond. And the only uh, other thing I'd like to say <laughs> is that we do, uh, we do operate on donations. And to be able to facilitate uh, uh, an expansion, to expand our capacity, uh, you can look into us, and, and, and we are at coreresponse.org backslash COVID-19. And I want to thank you, Mayor, and your extraordinary staff, and you, Chief. Uh, we are humbled and grateful to uh, be in a, in, a, in, a, in a city and state that is on the progressive edge of dealing with this brand new paradigm. Thank you so much, Sean, and, and please do go to CORE and donate, help them out, help them. I know the volunteers that have been coming really do expand our capacity. God bless you for the work you've been doing and appreciate Thank you, you very much. So when I talk about the power of partnerships, you can see it here. You can feel it in this city. And we're not just using it to save lives. We're also using technology to make sure we can have a force multiplier and expand the work that we're doing. And last week, that's why we were so excited that the Los Angeles Fire Department launched a new telemedicine program. We all know telemedicine maybe from calling a doctor or even having FaceTime these days with one, but for a fire department to do that is one of the most progressive moves done in this country. At its emergency dispatch center, specially trained physicians, nurse practitioners, and physician assistants are able to screen COVID-19 patients and other individuals who are calling 911 with non-life-threatening issues via a smartphone. This telemedicine program has been in development for two years and its rollout was accelerated by this pandemic. We want to assure patients to get the care they need as well as the safe, efficient deployment of our fire department, making sure that our first responders are where they need to be and we can get you the information that can save your life. And this has two benefits. It reduces potential emergency room crowding transport might bring to a hospital where somebody maybe feels that they have COVID-19 but didn't but could get it. It also makes sure as well that we decrease the exposure of our firefighters and paramedics to potential COVID-19 patients, as we've seen so tragically in cities like New York. To tell us a little bit more about this program, I'm going to turn it over to your chief, Ralph Terrazas. Thank you, Mayor. I'd also like to express my gratitude to Sean Penn and CORE. Our firefighters stepped up immediately to uh, pursue and conduct the mission of testing. And uh, when CORE first arrived on scene, uh, we were blown away with their professionalism and their service and their dedication. 
And that allows us to pull back our firefighters and paramedics to put them in uh, other critical missions. Now getting to telemedicine, uh, last week when I was here with uh, the mayor, uh, that was day one of the telemedicine program. Today is day eight. I spent a few hours there this afternoon and we're evolving, uh, we're learning things, and it is accomplishing the things that you stated, Mayor. I'll share with you one story. We have 100% patient follow-up, meaning that after we uh, process somebody through a telemedicine incident, we check with them the following day to see what is their medical status and what is their opinion of the pilot program. Uh, one gentleman offered that uh, he was extremely grateful and he wanted me to personally express his gratitude to the nurse practitioner who had provided that care. This gentleman was a mid middle-aged gentleman. Chief complaint was acute and chronic uh, neck and back pain. He was also diabetic, but he was fearful of going to the emergency room for fear of contracting the coronavirus. So the nurse practitioner was able to use a FaceTime-like uh, platform to see visually uh, the patient and then to ask multiple questions. At the end of the questioning, the nurse practitioner determined that what was needed was a new prescription. So the nurse practitioner made the call to the gentleman's local pharmacy and that pharmacy was able to provide him the necessary uh, medication. I shared with you what I consider a very successful telemedicine encounter. It maintains a high level of medical care as well as preserves our valuable EMS uh, resources. This is a, a great program. It's a, a great addition in terms of having a tool to deal with this pandemic. And I look for great things to continue to come from this program. Thank you so much, Chief. And thanks to, again, the men and women of this department who are just doing extraordinary work. Well, we have your back and thank you for having ours. You know, the COVID-19 outbreak is first and foremost a public health crisis but it's also igniting an economic emergency for Angelinos everywhere. While we're dealing with this health crisis, the cruelty of it is that it demands that we stay inside, that most of us aren't working. And half of the households have either been laid off, had somebody who's been laid off, or had reduced hours. So from the beginning, we've tried to not only save lives, but to save livelihoods as well. As part of that effort, we're taking steps to protect critical, good paying jobs at our airport. You can hear the plane that just went overhead, there's not many of them these days. After 9-11, we saw the biggest drop in plane flights in our airport's history. About 55% of our plane travel dropped off and it took 10 years to come back. Right now, 95% of our plane travel has stopped. It gives you an idea of the scale and the scope of how devastating this is. And not just for our amazing pilots and flight attendants, the crews, people who clean planes, people who make food for those passengers. It sets into motion job loss for people up and down, whether it's somebody working in a concession in the airport, an airport worker, or somebody in a related um, industry. And we cannot let our workforce bear the brunt of this emergency. We have to help them. Here in LA, we have the fourth busiest airport in the world. It's the number one busiest airport in this country of origination and destination, meaning that's where people get on and off the plane, not just a hub airport. And as such, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people depend on the economy of our airport. There've already been layoffs and furloughs for non-city workers at LAX, but as travel rebounds, we have to ensure that employees will be hired back and we have to protect their health and safety while they're off work. This week, we learned that LAX is slated to receive more than $323 million from the CARES Act and Van Nuys Airport over $157,000, helping us to maintain this vital infrastructure that we are going to need to pay our debt service, to continue building out those airports, and to keep employees on the job as we recover from this crisis. On top of that, airlines and their contractors are receiving $29 billion in federal funds from this legislation. But a condition of those funds is that they are required to retain almost all of their employees through September 30th. And the same way that we've said that Angelinos and small businesses who can't make the rent won't face eviction in this time, our LAWA, Los Angeles World Airport Commissioners, approved a series of steps designed to help airlines, concessions, or rental car outfits weather this downturn so they can grow their businesses and workforces again in the weeks and months ahead. Each of these companies are being given some sort of a rent deferral or reduction through June 30th. And our airlines will have to pay back any missed rent of their own over the course of six months stretch starting in July. 
We are proud to collaborate with our labor partners, the unions that represent the men and women who staff the airports and many of these other companies to enact these temporary changes. It's a critical industry that's been hard, hard hit by this pandemic, fueled by thousands of middle class workers who have seen paychecks and economic security hang in the balance. But by giving them a little bit more runway to remain up and running and requiring them to continue paying their employees will save jobs, will keep people in apartments, will make sure they can eat their food, and that good paying middle class jobs will continue to be the bedrock of our economy. Finally, so much of what we're doing is focus, focused on the immediate impacts of COVID-19, how it's affecting our health, our safety, our economic security, and that's absolutely essential. But we can't stop thinking about the investments we need to, to support the education of our students or the food security of our families, the safeties of, of our neighborhoods and the health of our communities over the long run as well. So I wanna reinforce one thing tonight, that if you're at home and you don't know what to do tonight and you haven't done it yet, fill out the census. We have an embarrassingly low percentage here in Los Angeles compared to the nation. Right now, around the nation, we have about 49.4% uh, of households that have already responded. In California, it's a little higher, 50.3%. San Diego is 55%. San Francisco, 48%. Here in LA, only 40% of us have filled that census out. So please go to census.gov and fill it out now because in emergencies like this, those dollars that we get to save the lives and the livelihoods of people depend on how many people they say are here. And so whether it's somebody who's unhoused or an immigrant, and I remind people it does not matter your status as an immigrant, you should and must be counted in the census. Make sure that you're counted and go to my2020census.gov and fill it out. Multiple languages, it's easy to do. I know I did it. Or you can also fill out the form you received in the mail and send it back or call in answers by dialing 844-330-2020. Simply put, there's no excuse to skip the census. Don't give that money away to another part of the country. Make sure you get the thousands of dollars that you deserve by filling that out. Almost every night, I offer you an update on the individuals and businesses that have generously given their time and their support and their money to helping those that are in need right now. And I wanna say a few more shout outs tonight. I wanna to thank Apple for donating 160,000 face shields to the city of Los Angeles to help protect hospital workers and first responders, presenting another example of a great California company using its ingenuity and resources to rapidly design personal protective equipment for folks on the front line. The clothing company Marine Layer makes the softest shirts I know. They've donated 20,000 face coverings through the LA Protects initiatives that we've talked about in these briefings and previous nights, helping keep garment workers employed during this crisis and providing protection to city workers and staff at organizations that serve domestic violence survivors, youth, and families. And the number of people we can help depends on everyone doing their part, whether it's in government, business, philanthropy, or elsewhere. And our ability to assist our neighbors grows with each donation to the Mayor's Fund. So after you've given decor, log on, check out the Mayor's Fund at mayorsfundla.org. And I've said every day from this uh, podium, whether it's $5 or $500, every bit matters. But there's two people I wanna single out who asked first not to be mentioned, but I wanna share with you that Wendy and Barry Meyer, they were on a conference call where I was raising money and telling people about the overwhelming uh, response to our Angelino cards, where we've had hundreds of thousands of people apply to try to get one of those cash cards for $700, $1,100, or $1,500. And as I said, the more money we get in, the more money we can give out. They had already contributed, between the two of them, $250,000. But afterwards, they reached out to a member of my team, and they said they wanted to double down, making it a half a million dollar donation. As I said, they didn't ask to be mentioned tonight. In Judaism, the highest form of charity is when it's done anonymously, so forgive me. But I'm putting their generosity out there because I hope it inspires others who have those means or even two bucks to go and to give us some money at mayorsfundla.org slash Angelino. We need to get as many Angelinos covered in this crisis as we can. Standing here before one of our great houses of worship, a place I've come to for services, for funerals, for celebrations and sad moments, many of us can take inspiration from the words of scripture. As the Psalms tell us, God restores my soul, God guides me, along the right paths. We all need those paths right now. And the path that you are helping guide us through, each one of you, by making sure that you get tested, 
by making sure that you stay home, by generously giving to help fellow Angelinos, means that this righteous path will take us through these foggy days to a sunny day ahead in which we will be together, we will be outside, and life will return as we once knew it. So keep that faith, fellow Angelinos. And for those who are watching across the state and country, keep that faith. Los Angeles will do its part for Angelinos and for this state, this country, and this world. And as we do, let's build our future even stronger than it was before. And so as I always say, stay healthy, stay safe, and stay at home. Much strength and love to all of you, Los Angeles. Thank you. And with that, I'll answer questions. Thanks. Uh, Mayor, the first question comes from Alex Michelson of Fox 11 News. What kinds of conversations have you had internally about the possibility of an immunity card and how that might make it easier for people to return to work? Absolutely. Well, thank you. And John Regardi is our pool reporter who's asking the questions tonight. And thank you to John and to Alex as well. So, Alex, um, an immunity card is an interesting thing, and it's something we certainly are looking at closely. But it also depends on how many people are, quote unquote, immune. The blood test, the serology test that we will need to see whether people have had coronavirus and that researchers are still trying to confirm, but early research shows that it probably should provide at least some immunity in the medium term. We're still not sure how this novel coronavirus will act and COVID-19's impact will be. It could be like a cold that you develop some immunity to and in future years you, uh, when it either changes or when that immunity wears off, you could be susceptible again. But if we could have that, it would allow us to, as we've seen in other cities, for instance in Wuhan, China, they have a green, yellow, and red system. Red means that you still are susceptible or that you uh, potentially have COVID-19. Green is that you have this immunity, and yellow is that you're in a quarantine state. This would be something that would allow more people to go to work, allow more people to go to school. But my worry is that our success here in flattening the curve, while the best news is it saved lives, it also means most of us have not been exposed to the coronavirus and COVID-19. So we're gonna also need more than just immunity passports to get some of us back to work, back to school, and back into spaces and places. Because we can't wait for the entire year. We can't wait for two years. We're going to have to figure out tracking and tracing. We're going to have to have more testing like this for who's infectious, because for the immunity passports, it's a different test, it's a blood test. But these swab tests help us know if you're infectious right now. And we're gonna to need to be able to surveil really quickly the entire community. So knowing there's a hot spot in one neighborhood and potentially closing that off, keeping some people who are especially vulnerable like our seniors and people with pre-existing health conditions um, may be home longer. But it is definitely one of the arrows in our quiver, one that I hope that we can um, use. And I hope in the next few days to share more news about our more formal process of how we're going to have those conversations about reopening uh, the city with the county, neighboring cities as well, Southern California in the weeks and months ahead. Thank you, next question. Uh, Mayor, this one is mine. Even as the number of new cases each day has been falling recently, there's tended to be about 1,500 available hospital beds, hundreds of ICU beds in the range of 1,000 ventilators. Given where things are, do you believe that Los Angeles has avoided having local hospitals overburdened by COVID-19 patients? And if so, what's the reaction and how does this impact the use of the Mercy and the Convention Center? Absolutely. Um, thank you, uh, John, for the question. It's we see the cases still going up. The rate of cases has bent. The curve has gone this way, and that's good news. But even though it's a slower climb, it's still a climb. In other words, more people are going into the hospital beds than are coming out of the hospital beds each day. That said, our hospitals have done an incredible job. We do think that in the next couple weeks, and that's about as far as you can look, that they have the capacity, the ventilators, the beds, to be able to deal with the cases that are coming in if everybody stays at home. And I've seen projections where if people start to loosen up, that could change in a week. That could change in two weeks. That could change very quickly. In fact, if we stopped our stay at home today, just went cold turkey and everybody I said, go out, uh, the projection I saw that by August 1st, 95% of us would be infected. And I don't have to tell you how many deaths that would mean and how much that would overwhelm the system. So um, that is, I think, very important for us to track. In terms of the alternative spaces, yes, the Mercy has been looking at taking in some of the seniors from Orange County and Los Angeles County who are in vulnerable places to make sure that they are cared for and if they have cases that they can come in there. Um, and the convention center remains available and ready. 
I think it's always been kind of a Swiss Army knife, a multi-purpose place that could go towards if the hospitals were overwhelmed, non-COVID-19 cases, at one point it was going to be for lesser COVID-19 cases, or if there's an outbreak, for instance, on Skid Row. And the unhoused population of people who are experiencing homelessness to me is still, we can't get those hotel and motel rooms quickly enough, fast enough. We're getting people in there and we've stood up, as you know, almost a thousand beds now of shelter in our rec centers. But um, if something happens quick and we can't move in a single day someplace, it's good to know those beds are there. So that's what we're looking at potentially for the convention center. Great. Thank you. Thank the you. next question comes from Jory Rand of ABC7. Um, uh, he's wondering, um, Sean, is this some, um, if this was something that you and the leaders of CORE would have done already simply because there was a crisis and people needed help, or was there a shortcoming or incident you observed that led you to act? In other words, would you be doing this regardless of how the situation was being handled, and what, if any, hurdles have you encountered? Yeah, it's a good question. I, when uh, when uh, the um, hurricane hit New Orleans, I watched on the news for many days with the assumption uh, that, 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 that local and federal government uh, would be covering it and that one might get in the way. And what I found out, separate and apart from any of the legitimate criticism that happened related to government response at that time, is that in these kinds of disasters, all the planning in the world, which of course you know, does take a national strategy as well, still doesn't, doesn't, uh, is too much, too high a demand uh, for any, any existing forces to, to, to handle if citizens don't get in, involved. And what, what, again, what I, like I had said earlier, once you bring your own lessons learned and you come into a situation like this, which where we, where, for me, what it, was, what it was, was saying to my CEO, Ann Lee, and we've got to get involved and, and offer to support, supplement, basically be at the directive of first. And if there's no leadership there, well, then we'll find a way to, to, to a activate. But instead, and, and, and virtually like I've never seen or experienced before, there was such leadership in place that we were able to be guided direct, directly into a position where we could alleviate some of the pressure of the Los Angeles Fire Department, as, as the chief was talking about. And from that, we're, we're, we're looking to develop other ways to, 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 to help support, fill gaps which are inevitable and have to do with re, uh, resource issues that nobody standing at these microphones controls. So we're, I'm just uh, really uh, privileged to, to, to be in that. And, and really, we have uh, the Haitian people to originally thank for it because they really taught us our way in understanding what it is to work with community, to ask what the community needs, and in this case, to ask what the city needs and have such a dynamic leadership uh, give us an answer. And uh, the next question is from Ryan Carter of the Daily News. Mm -hmm. It uh, touches on a similar subject for the mayor, the fire chief, or Sean. Can someone describe the load that CORE, can say a little bit more about the load that CORE has taken off of the fire department? In other words, can they give a measure of how many firefighters may have been able to get back to their normal jobs instead of administering tests? And can this model, which CORE is doing, be scaled up and take on even more of a load than the four stations that you mentioned before? Chief, do you want to take up? I will. Thank you, John. The... Uh, the mission of testing is not something we normally do, and it took uh, quite a few of our firefighters away from their normal duties. So when CORE came in, it allowed us to reallocate our people to different functions. Uh, one of those things with this was to support the convention center uh, transition. Another one was to staff our emergency operations center and our department operations center. Um, the We do anticipate that our firefighters may, if in the future, it's possible we could have more of our firefighters become positive. As I told you earlier, we only had 19 so far, but if that were to spike, I would need those uh, people that were on the test sites to redeploy them to staff fire trucks and ambulances. So there's, there's many, many things that I'm now able to redeploy thanks to the core organization. You want to take the second half, then? Yeah, I'll, I'll, do, I'll, I'll do my best. In terms of the scale-up, we are, we are actively looking to build capacity um, with uh, three separate specific agendas. One is, again, at the, at the direction of the, of the mayor's office in the Los Angeles Fire Department, specific to the city of Los Angeles, 
and being able to staff up to absorb as many sites as, as need be. But also, we, we hope to share this model, whether that re relates to other partners that, that, uh, that the mayor's office may, may have doing uh, similar functions. And then separately, CORE will also be scaling up statewide, working with the governor's office. And we hope again to be uh, moving outward. We, we, do, we are working with the Rockefeller Foundation as a partnership, moving into uh, three out-of-state locations as well, uh, organizing local um, uh, staff in those areas, staff and volunteers in those areas. So the, 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 the hope is that all of this talk about staffing up and capacity building, it's my job to, with, with my staff to, to gnaw, bite, scratch, and kick to expand uh, uh, and, and force multiply as much as possible. But there, the hope is that with the scientific community's uh, I I enormous um, investment that we'll be transitioning these sites at some point to inoculation sites and then uh, hopefully learning to prepare for the next such event. Uh, the next question is from Elizabeth Joe of the Los Angeles Daily News. She'd like to know how much the test sites have cost the city so far in terms of labor, operating test kit, and other costs, and also what kit suppliers the city has been using and are getting ready to use. Sure. Um, I don't have an exact number because it changes every single day. Uh, now we have the county also helping pay for the county sites, and you don't have to be from the city uh, to come to a city site, and you don't have to. You can live in the city and go to a county site. So we've taken that away. Um, the test kits that we have um, have been from a mix of different places. We've had some test kits that um, uh, are going through uh, individual laboratories. So we buy the kits separate and send them to places like Quest Labs was the first place that we went through. And they really helped us get both the kits and, la and some of the tests. We have some from Everly Well through the partnership with United Parcel Service. And Everly Well uh, has uh, stepped up as a kit and lab producer as well. And then Curative is the third based here in Diamond Bar. Uh, that has allowed us to do that. So some of them, the Everly Well ones, are going out for our testing people who are experiencing homelessness and our seniors and our rapid response teams. Um, we've had some uh, early on, especially for our first responders and city staff that went through Quest. Um, the bulk of them right now is going through Curative. Uh, the next question comes and, from... And sorry, Liz, I'll, I'll get you an answer to how much we spent to date. It's certainly something we're tracking because we're going to be submitting that for 75% reimbursement from FEMA. Uh, the next question comes from Steve Gregory of KFI. Um, Mayor, LAPD Chief Michael Moore hinted in a video message to employees that cuts are likely. He said that the department would adjust, innovate, and persevere. What will you ask of the LAPD and other larger departments in terms of cuts? And then Chief Taratsis, uh, from the question he posed to the mayor, what cuts are likely in your department? So as we always say, you know, we saw in 2008 during the Great Recession, cuts across every department. While we didn't have any layoffs and we didn't furlough people from public safety because we've always said that that, you know, 911, you have to have those calls answered. You need to make sure there's a firefighter, paramedic, make sure that there's a police officer. So we're not proposing to cut uh, any of the personnel. But every department will be expected to make cuts. That might mean less overtime. It might mean some less specialized units. Everybody has had to have a belt tightening. At the beginning of this, um, I said there would be no new hiring. We put a hiring freeze. We did a number of things, stopping all new programs that didn't have to do with COVID-19. And luckily, and I'm going to be presenting my budget in the next few days and giving my state of the city address on Sunday by charter, um, we saw two bond rating agencies just in the last day or two uh, say that we were not only stable, but did not downgrade us, which is almost unheard of right now, given that cities across this country and around the world are being downgraded. They've already laid people off, et cetera. But we put more money in our reserve fund, double what we had before 2008. Uh, we were able to do those things very quickly. And we have diverse revenue sources, but they will be down dramatically. And nobody's at hotels hardly. There's nobody at the airport. We're seeing sales tax down, all sorts of places. We're not enforcing parking tickets because we shouldn't be while people are being required to be at home in those residential areas. So we're going to see that. My expectation of this chief, of our police chief, is that even though their people have a little bit more immunity around them in term, because we need them so badly, they are not immune from uh, needing to manage their money, cut and make sure that we don't have any fat. This is about just the muscle that'll get us through this. And I'll, I'll let the chief say anything if he wants to add. Thank you, Mayor. The, um, the 
uh, news has not been very positive. You know, everybody can see what's happening in the economy. In terms of cuts to the fire department uh, for next fiscal year, we're looking at potentially less drill tower classes. You know, the last thing we want to do is take any firefighters and paramedics from the field, but we can um, conduct business with the people we have now. We may have to delay the, uh, the hiring of new firefighters. Uh, in terms of equipment, we've been very fortunate the last few years. We've really restored our department in terms of new fire trucks, helicopters, and technology. So we're in a good place right now. So we're waiting for the instructions from the mayor's office, and we'll work collaboratively to come to a, a good budget. We will. And I can guarantee you we will still have some fire classes next year. We need to continue doing some hiring. Take the next question. Thank you. Uh, the next question is from Dakota Smith of the Los Angeles Times. Mayor, have you visited the new L.A. Surge Hospital in Westlake? If so, what did you see and how would you describe it? And what role do you see this facility playing during this crisis? Um, I assume the Surge Hospital may be referring to St. Vincent's, uh, but I'm not sure. I have not visited it. Um, I, uh, we have been working very hard at the convention center. Uh, which is the other kind of surge potential hospital that's there. But I, I have not yet been to St. Vincent, so I cannot speak to that. Sorry. Uh, a question from uh, Leslie Marn of KCAL CBS regarding the Angelino Fund. The deadline was today. How many people applied? Um, and yesterday you said there were more requests than money. Is this still the case tonight? Will everyone who applies get an Angelino card? No, and we've said that from the beginning. Although the more donations that come in, the more people will. Um, let me see if I get the numbers here from the end of the day, we had 445,000 applications by the time this ended. If that isn't a sobering number for how many people need our help, um, I don't know what would be. So I'm glad to see that we're going to be able to put millions of dollars out, depending on donations that come in, hopefully each week or a couple weeks, we'll continue that. As I said, folks who have applied but don't get it the first time, we'll keep those names and we'll keep doing random draws because we know for households how much that helps. We'll be doing those sit-down interviews. Uh, we don't know that that's necessarily each one person. Uh, we want to make sure that it is. We want to make sure that it's one person per household. Uh, so it might have been that a household put in five or six, uh, every family member, but we'll sit down and make sure that they know they're eligible and each child will give them some more money, but that it's one card per household. Um, and so that money will start hitting the street next week. Um, but it closed today at 430 and uh, 445,068 applications came in. Right. And so far, it looks like the last one from uh, Ben Oreskes of the L.A. Times. Mayor, you've mentioned Judge David Carter in these addresses over the last few weeks. Could you describe what role you think he's had on the city and county's response to the pandemic with respect to homelessness? Has there been a layer of accountability on elected officials that didn't previously exist? Or do you think he's overstepped and is interfering with how you'd like to respond? No, Dave Carter has been amazing. Uh, he's become a friend. I was a, a fan of his watching what he did in Orange County to kind of knock heads together and to make sure that Orange County was stepping up and did some marvelous work to make sure that they're housing their people that were experiencing homelessness. And he has been uh, a friend, uh, an ally, and a fair judge. Uh, he's helped us. Uh, he went out to Skid Row in the midst of this pandemic, saw that some of our WASH centers weren't being serviced quickly enough, called me. I appreciated hearing that. And by the next day, we got went from weekly to daily cleanings and um, putting soap and water and towels in those places because that's going to be the difference between people contracting COVID-19 and not. The other night we had a great agreement now and move some people off the streets and into parking lots near Skid Row. He's gone out there with council members, I think almost every council member, visited also our uh, rec centers. And he's been a really helpful voice with other levels of government because we've had a great partnership between the city and county. But he's saying, OK, city, you step up and do this. County, can you provide more people to help them? You've got health care workers or public health workers or other folks. So I've been very pleased at his presence. I think he's going to be a very positive force. And as he said to me from the beginning, he can kind of bring the outstretched wings of the federal court and insist that everybody be accountable. As I said two years ago, homelessness in Los Angeles required a FEMA level response. And Though we had some brave moves from the state, we had the beginning of some brave moves from Washington, my conversation with Ben Carson, it wasn't until this pandemic hit that we saw the tens of millions of dollars. We just got a $19 million check uh, minutes before I got here from the state emergency dollars, and we hope to see the federal funds come uh, soon as well. That's $50 million we didn't have. That's hotel rooms, that's motel rooms. And I'd say to any hotel or motel owner, give us those rooms, we need them right now. And I wanna give you the statistics uh, on those real quick because uh, Judge Carter has been helpful with uh, pushing that forward too. But right now we have, in terms of 
the tier one rooms, which are for folks who have not yet contracted COVID-19, but could, who are experiencing homelessness, there's 1,827 rooms in the county. That's awesome. Uh, we need to get that up to 15,000, the stretch goal, but that's an awesome start. 514 of those are already occupied. 903 of those rooms are in the city of LA with 310 occupied. For tier two, which is for folks who are homeless or who are not experiencing homelessness but have no place to go when they get sick, there's 900 rooms in that, 512 of them in the city and 153 of those occupied. He and I have talked about testing. He has supported the testing work that we're doing uh, to get out there. I'll share that with you as well real quick. Um, we have tested uh, so far, we've delivered 1,300 tests to shelters and clinics. Uh, I know Claudia asked me last night uh, from KNX uh, about the first death of somebody experiencing homelessness. That person was not experiencing homelessness. Uh, they were a worker who lived in the shelter and was not homeless. Um, and our heart breaks for that person because that was early on. And we have lost somebody who was an angel to so many providing help um, uh, at the Union Rescue Mission. And so to Andy and everybody, our, our heart breaks for you with that. Uh, we have. Um, Though tested, I put out 1,300 tests, 364 tests already administered, only nine positive among people experiencing homelessness, 294 negative, and 61 pending. Um, and so far, the numbers are either 33 or it could be 32. They're checking one person of uh, individuals experiencing homelessness who have uh, uh, tested positive for COVID-19. So, And uh, one more sure. question has come in from Victor Cordero. Um, he asks, uh, Mayor, what do you think of the idea to open the country in a three-phase process as President Trump suggested today? And he asked if you could answer that in English and in Spanish. Sure. And that's the last question. Thank you, Victor. And as I transition to Spanish, feel free you guys to either stand or leave. Either way. But uh, thank you, Victor, for the question. I, I want to read it because I just heard about it. So I always like to read things beforehand. But as I said last night in the five principles I put forward, we're going to have to have some certain things. And we have to think about this as kind of the on and off. Sometimes we're going to see um, the switch go off and people can go out. And there's going to be times, as we've t referred to it here, where this pandemic may come back and we have another spike and we're going to have to go back on. Some of that's driven by the season. Some of that's going to be driven by how well we have the test. So it's not just going to be three phases and done. It may be a framework for understanding how we can go out, come back in, go out, come back in, but at least have some days and weeks and months where we're not indoors the whole time, where our economy is not suffering, where people are not earning an income. So I look forward to seeing that. But uh, I've talked to some folks who are working on the presidential task force. I think there's some really good ideas there. I loved what the governor put out. And as I said, in the next few days, we'll announce how we're going to synthesize that and apply it here to L.A. And I think L.A. can lead in a number of ways. Uh, in the entertainment industry, for instance, we can write the rules of how do you get back safely to a set uh, for sports and entertainment and concerts. How can we do that? Maybe it's sports without audiences this year, but at least we can have players tested and playing in the leagues, which is important for so many people's livelihoods as well as for all of our enjoyment and entertainment. So we think LA can have an outsized role in helping inform the, what the White House does, what the world does, and what the state does as well. Uh, in Espanol también, yo quiero decir, um, no hay un sistema, pero uh, la propuesta del presidente Trump hoy, los tres fases de uh, el rey abierto de uh, este país, es uh, una empieza buena. Pero también los principales del gobernador Newsom y los principales de la ciudad que, y el condado de Los Ángeles son importantes también, porque tenemos industrias únicas aquí como uh, entrenamiento, uh, como uh, el intercambio entre el puerto y aeropuerto. Yo quiero uh, escribir estas regulaciones con los líderes a nivel nacional y estatal, porque no, no es un sistema donde solamente estamos en este orden más seguro en, en, en nuestras casas y luego es normal. Tal vez hay ciertas meses cuando nosotros eh, estaremos en nuestras casas y otros meses donde nosotros podemos trabajar. Y este uh, puede dar uh, más dinero, más horas de trabajo a nuestra gente y salvar las vidas de la comunidad al, al mismo tempo, tiempo. With that, I'm going to turn to my Spanish remarks for tonight to translate. Thanks again to everybody for tuning in uh, who's tuning in from English. We'll see you tomorrow. Muy buenas tardes, Los Ángeles. 
Estoy aquí hoy en el sur de Los Ángeles, en el Centro Cristiano Crenshaw, uno de nuestros sitios de pruebas de detección y una iglesia increíble en la ciudad de Los Ángeles. Esta es la locación original por la Universidad de Pepperdine y es un parte íntegro de nuestra ciudad. Y no estamos solos en esta lucha y es un privilegio estar aquí con algunos quienes están luchando a nuestro lado. Especialmente yo quiero decir mis gracias al jefe del Departamento de Bomberos, uh, el jefe Terrazas, Cynthia Davis, un, una profesora en el Colegio de Medicina en la Universidad Charles Drew, y el actor Sean Penn, quien fundó CORE, una organización ayudándonos en nuestros esfuerzos para brindar pruebas para angelinos. Primero, les comparto los últimos datos en Los Ángeles. Hoy hubieron 399 nuevos casos en el condado de Los Ángeles, llegando a un total de 10,854. En la ciudad tuvimos 145 nuevos casos, llegando a un total de 4,852. Y es una tragedia porque hoy fallecieron 55 personas más en el condado. Un nuevo récord. Este es el tercer, la, el tercer día con un récord de estos fallecieron, llegando a un total de 455. Y lo siento mucho por las familias que están sufriendo como el resultado de estas uh, personas. Estos es, no solamente son miembros de su familia, pero parte de la familia Angelina también. En nuestros hospitales, buenas noticias, tenemos 1,558 camas disponibles. Entre ellas, y 249 están en las unidades de cuidados intensivos. Y tenemos 1,129 respiradores disponibles. Y seguimos trabajo, nuestro trabajo para ampliar el acceso a las pruebas de detección. Tenemos ahora 30 sitios para pruebas de detección en la ciudad y el condado de Los Ángeles. Y hasta ahora hemos hecho pruebas a más de 61,000 personas. En sola una semana hemos duplicado el número de pruebas y en una semana vamos a tener al menos de 90,000 pruebas completas. Además, tenemos un equipo de respuesta inmediata, inmediata haciendo pruebas en casas para personas de tercera edad. En una semana ya han hecho más de 600 pruebas para estas personas vulnerables. Si tienen síntomas, pueden hacer una cita para una prueba en la página coronavirus.lacity.org diagonal testing. Solo individuos se pueden inscribir. Si tiene síntomas de COVID-19 y vive con varios miembros de familia, haga citas individuales para cada persona. Gracias. La semana pasada, el Departamento de Bomberos lanzó un nuevo programa de telemedicina en su centro de despacho de emergencias con médicos y enfermeros capacitados para detectar posibles pacientes con COVID-19 que llaman al 911 con problemas de menor riesgo a través de un teléfono inteligente. Este programa permite que profesionales de salud puedan evaluar a los pacientes de forma remota tanto como limita las personas en las salas de emergencia y reduce el riesgo de infección de COVID-19 para nuestros bomberos. También estamos pensando en el futuro de nuestra ciudad. Con la reducción de menos de 95% de pasajeros en LAX, no podemos dejar que nuestra fuerza laboral cargue con la peor parte de esta emergencia. Esta semana supimos que LAX recibirá más de 323 millones de dólares y Vanais recibirá más de 157 mil dólares del programa Federal Cares para continuar mejoramientos de infraestructura y mantener a los empleados con un trabajo. Hay mucha gente en nuestra comunidad que trabaja en los aeropuertos y este es muy importante para todos nosotros. Además, no podemos dejar de pensar en las inversiones que necesitaremos para apoyar la educación de nuestros estudiantes, la seguridad alimentaria de nuestras familias, la seguridad de nuestros vecindarios y la salud de nuestras comunidades a largo plazo. Por eso, es tan importante 
participar en el censo. Todos deben participar. Y esta es una oportunidad que llega cada 10 años. Y un conteo completo asegurar que recibamos los recursos que necesitamos durante desastres como esto para servicios críticos como escuelas, infraestructura y servicios de salud, transporte y vivienda. Hasta ahora tenemos una tasa de respuesta de solamente 40%. No puedo decirlo suficiente. Necesitamos que todos participen y respondan en línea en el sitio my2020census.gov. My2020census.gov. Puede completar el formulario que se recibió por correo y enviarlo de vuelta. O puede dar sus respuestas llamando al 844-330-2020. No hay excusa para no participar en el censo. Aún para inmigrantes, tengan confianza que todas las respuestas son completamente confidenciales. Este es muy importante. No tengan miedo. Esta información no es por diferentes departamentos del gobierno federal, es confidencial. Como hacemos siempre, construyamos un mejor futuro juntos. Quédense en buena salud, mis amigos. Quédense protegidos y quédense en casa. Mucha fuerza y mucho amor. Hasta mañana. Gracias.